Hi, I'm Jimmy Ogle. <laughs> and Willie, Willie needs that, you see. That's just, no. uh, thank you all for coming. You know what we're doing, filming these uh, tours uh, for the Downtown Memphis Commission, for their archives and other people to use forever and ever, you know. In 2019, our bicentennial gift to Memphis. Like, you've seen a lot of pictures of this building right here. Didn't know it was this building, you know. Thank you for filming. Thank you. And, uh, and, and somebody took pictures in 1890 when it was a, a, a building that's on the other side of this facade here with two big five-story tall columns or, or towers on it that got torn down in the 1920s and just built around. Or the old library down here that looked like a castle, you know. Somebody took pictures of Front Street like that from different angles in the 1890s and 1920s and 1940s. And we're doing it for 2019 because from 30 years from now, this is going to look different, I assure you, later on. There was a bank there, you know, and, a, and a small buildings down here where these towers are. And Cotton Row, there's cotton everywhere. It's all different now. So that's the importance of what we're doing right now. Uh, so we're here at Madison and Front. And the quote we have here is this is where cotton meet, met banking in Memphis. And usually all the cotton guys owned the banks anyway, didn't they, Willie? I mean, uh, as those cotton merchants were so rich and powerful and political and in agriculture and wholesale grocery industry, all these other businesses and stuff. But this is a part, Front Street was the original Front Street to the riverfront. That's why it was called Front Street. There was no railroad tracks, no Riverside Drive down below, no Mud Island out in there hadn't formed yet to the peninsula. So this was open. In the original plan in 1819 from Union Avenue down to about the pyramid, from front down to the water, was the promenade set aside by the founders later on in the 1820s for open public use, okay? And it wasn't until 1885 it first got shot. So what was being happening between 1820s and 1885, the steamboat era comes in. These areas, this open land is used for storing pallets and, and uh, barrels and mules and carts and everything to service the cobblestones down here and all the steamboats uh, going down this slope right here. 1885, this building gets built. Uh, not this building, but the building behind it. It's inside it. In the 1920s, the north, east, and south side came around, you see. So there's actually two buildings right here if you go around to the other side. And it was built as the United States Customs House, Courthouse, and Post Office up there. 1893, the library gets built down here. If you want to come closer, come on. Uh, 1893, the library gets built. Of course, Cotton Rose all through here. There's smaller buildings all through here at the time. Uh, about this building right here, <clears throat> you get up to the 1960s, we get automobiles and expressways, a booming airport. The new federal building gets built down here in 1963 at Front and Poplar. So the uh, courthouses, federal courthouses, move down there. And then the custom house moves out to the International Airport. You see, that leaves just the post office here. If you remember, occupying about 10 or 15% of the building for about 40 years, a very underutilized building until the early 2000s. University of Memphis gets interested in it, and that's the law school. The Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law opened here on January 2010. Cecil C. Humphreys was the president of the Memphis State University from like 1957 to uh, like 1971, and that's the time frame there. And uh, so it became that in 2010. And it's uh, two years ago by the Law Review magazine, it was voted the top law school facilities in the country. That's really cool. And this third level up here was where the federal courthouse courtroom was, and they restored it so it can be used as a courtroom. And sometimes it is when the state Supreme Court judges come down, they'll use this courtroom or they'll use the one over in the courthouse too. Movies film up here. Bluff City Law is filming right now. All these trucks are out here the other day. Uh, so the building is a very great uh, community building as well. There is a tour of this building like on a daily basis when classes in session students give a tour like at noon Monday through Friday of the building you know so I'll come back for that on the riverside is where the new suffrage memorial will be installed at the end of this year looking out at the rivers a great site right there <coughs> what I'm standing on now is the Korean World War II veterans memorial here in Memphis one of them uh, this was a fountain that had a very mo modern uh, structure, metal structure right here, kind of a T-shape with the water coming out and a fountain. But fraternities started putting suds in it and bubbles started coming out, you know. Hobos will come up and 
bathe in it or pee in it or whatever. Cars started coming down, not seeing the light at Front Street and running right into it. You see some of the granite is different colors or marbles different colors. So they finally decided to take the fountain out and the water out and put the planter in here later on. Then right in front of us here, if we zero down right here to the zero mile marker for Memphis. This is a very interesting story here. This was put, I think it says 1923, right? By the Engineers Club of Memphis. Okay. And uh, back when the city was first formed, uh, the, the original city plan had us starting about on the north boundary, about where the pyramid is, down to Union, from the Wolf River to about Danny Tobbitt's. That's 1,300 acres. And it was the numbering system started one to 1,000 this way. And then 1844, we annexed from Union Avenue down to about the train station, which was one to about a thousand that way in that city. And then only were Fort Pickering. And then by 1899, we had annexed all the way out to Overton Park. Now we had all these weird duplicate numbers and street duplications. So in 1905, the city tried to clean that up with one fell swoop, and they brought the zero mile marker to right here. So if you're coming in from Nashville, you get out there to Sycamore View and it's exit 12, but you're in Memphis. You got 12 more miles to go to get to here. Same thing if you're coming from the Mississippi from the south or Arkansas from the west. You got to have one central spot, otherwise you're going to be losing mileage if you do it on the, say, the city limits or something. So if most cities have a zero point in their old downtown areas. They might not have an elaborate granite marker like this, but if you see on the top, there it is. And in 1905, they did a, like a reshuffling of everything. So everything south of Madison Avenue is South Front Street or South Main Street. North is North Front all the way out to about the parkways, actually East High School, you'll see out there on Holmes Road, one of those old concrete markers that's a street marker. So Walnut Grove becomes the north-south line there, you see, all the way out to Shelby Farms. Uh, that way, one, two, three that way, one, two, three that way, and then east and west starts uh, just a little, about, about Riverside Drive. Uh, and all the people along here, well, gosh, we got our businesses here, we gotta change our stationery, our business cars, how come people going to find us? And they kind of refused to do it. And so they had a real confrontation for a couple of years. And finally, the, the government said, well, you know, the post office cannot knowingly deliver mail to a wrong address. So they stopped getting their mail. That made them change their address, you see. That's how they did. That's kind of a funny story. Paul Coppock covers that in his books. Uh, and if you ever read a Paul Coppock book, like the tooth building down here, might have been built in the 1890s, and the, at, at that time it would be, 108 Madison or something like that. Well, now it's like 188 Madison, you know, the old numbering system. He'll always identify in 1905. You look at the city directories and try to compare building addresses back and forth. You're looking up. You got to start counting off from the intersections. The intersections, are, streets basically remain the same. Uh, some of the names have changed, but that kind of tells you that. And on the back side here, uh, it says 274 feet right here from sea level. So if you think about our river gauge here is what at 13 feet today, Robert, or something like that. That's 13 feet above 184 feet sea level. It's the standard we set back in the 1870s. So that was 184 is down there. Uh, Riverside Drive is about uh, what two 224. So you're now 50 feet higher up here. You see as you come up the bluff. Uh, that's why downtown Memphis will never flood because it's just too much to come up here and too much flat Arkansas for it had to flood. It flooded Little Rock before it flooded downtown Memphis, literally, I think, you know. Uh, let's see. If you look up and down Front Street here, let's look to the north first. Uh, you got the Falls building right here, built in 1912 by James Falls. He's buried over in Elmwood, exclusively for cotton merchants. The whole 12-story building, uh, not on the top of there is a a room called the Alaskan Roof Garden. It had air conditioning. And it was like, like the Peabody Skyway Room or the Balinese Ballroom. They had big bands playing up their parties on the rooftop. Alaskan Roof Garden. 1916, W.C. Haney premiered the St. Louis Blues out of that building. Apparently in 1923, our first baseball game ever broadcast in Memphis the radio came out of that building. Uh, the radio station was WMC, which was over there across from Court Square. That's really rude for them to do that, isn't it? I'm not going to talk over that. You better get down Madison Avenue is all I'm going to say. 
Okay, good. You see the Raymond James building now? That's where the Hotel King Cotton used to be. It was imploded in 1984 to make way for the Raymond James. It was the uh, Morgan Keegan building at the time, 1987. Converted to Raymond James. And then on down you'll see uh, the, the Governmental Civic Center. And then the Convention Center down there. On the west side you have Fourth Bluff or Memphis Park, formerly Confederate Park, built in 1907. Uh, a parking garage built in 1955. Again, open free, or not free, but open public use things. It's not a private business in there, let's say. The library right here, 1893. This new modern library front came in the, the late 1950s, early 1960s. Parking garage came in 1955. And then down there at Front and Union, you got the fire station, which was built in 1895. A new one built in 1959, 1960 that you see there now. And then Front Street Deli, then on the east side of the street, you see some of the old Cotton Row buildings from the 1880s, 1890s, the three-story buildings where at Cotton Row, uh, all the cotton would be piled up on the street sidewalks, the big snakes, you know, cotton be drifting around, you know. Um, the first level was the cotton factors receiving offices. The second level will be other industries like uh, insurance and shipping supplies and things like that. And the top level is where they took the cotton up to classic because back then they didn't have the fluorescent light to really see it real good. So they had these northern oriented skylights at a different angle. You can see some of them to get the, the northern oriented light coming in so they can see a little bit better from the top. So they had to take the cotton up three stories of classic to bring it back down. Just go back to the boats and into the trains to get out of here. You can see looking around that way right here uh, it's called Metro 67. A little odd story about this is that's two buildings right there. One built in 1913, one built in 1923. The Northern Port, 1913. The Shorter Port, 1923. Union Planters Bank, big bank in concern here, got converted about eight years ago to be residential. And the parking garage right here next to us was the parking garage servicing that. There's a tunnel underneath it. Used to be a tunnel from the courthouse here. Uh, to uh, the bank a long time ago as well. This is still an active tunnel for the residents to have security walking from their cars into the building from underneath. Uh, you can barely see some, some uh, something hanging out from the top of the roof. That's a heliport. William Matthews sometimes would fly a helicopter in here and land to come to work. He was the president of the bank from like Rossville, Tennessee. There's another heliport on top of the uh, jail at 201 Poplar. I think one out there, of course, at the hospitals. They got some rooftop landings as well. Uh, the parking garage came again. You got two series of parking garages here from the 1950s and from the 1980s. The 1950s parking garages you see around downtown, all the hotels and everything after World War II had to start building parking garages because everybody's traveling by cars at that time. You know, so they, if they, they couldn't have a place to park the cars. They couldn't get people in the businesses. And of course, Holiday Inn and stuff came in, people going out to the highways anyway. So they're trying to combat that trend. Then after downtown emptied out in the 70s, uh, the renewal in the 1980s being more cars coming down, so you got a set like the, in the 1980s and a little bit about the 2000s over by the Peabody complex. So this garage is in the 1980s. You got the Shrine building there at Monroe and uh, front built in 1923. And then the Cotton Exchange building down there as well. This alley right here called Floyd Alley, that is a bit. So if you saw the movie The Firm that was filmed in Memphis, most of it, and the Bahamas and Boston. Now the scenes where Tom Cruise in the movie The Firm uh, was coming down with the, at the very first movie, he was a waiter with a tray. He's supposed to be in Boston. That was filmed at 356 North Main when Jake had Jake's place. And instead of taking all the crew up to Boston, they brought a bunch of posters down, took Jake's Memphis posters down, put the Boston posters up. A couple <laughs> of those posters are in Westies. Well, that's how they sometimes do these scenes. Well, this, he comes up Riverside Drive. You can't duplicate that in Boston. He's actually coming to Memphis anyway. Comes up front, goes in parks, comes in, walks in those doors down there into the Bendini Lambert and Locke office. And his next step is in Frazier at the International Harvester Plant. You see, we're talking about filming movies here. Some are filmed in Memphis, some are not scenes here and there, and how you re reenact all that. People love filming in Memphis, they really do. And so this is where Bendini Lambert and Lot was in, in your thoughts in the movie, but really the, the set was in Frazier. Even when he was running around like that, he's running around on the same floor. You see him going down like that, and then, then he jumps out. Uh, the, the window over here, a stunt double jumps out in the, in the cotton truck right there. That's where that happened right there. All right, let's, let's uh, well, next, next red light will cross. Jimmy. Yes. I don't know, somewhere between where the fire station and the garage is. Why, I do not know, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> it might happen. The, the new, new Bro they're talking about moving Brooks down here oh, yeah. for some oh, reason. Yeah. But. Well, the architect is speaking. 
Well, great. Well, then he'll tell you exactly. He'll give you all the plans and more power to it. Yeah. There is, you know, for the last few years, been a movement to re enliven some of these lands, like going behind the, the nice space behind the law school or behind the library. And, and of course, a garage is a garage is a garage. And people are going to drive cars, you know. So, we just, and of course, we don't have the cars on the cobblestones. Let's go. Look at this sign, this historical marker here placed by the Tennessee Historical Commission. There are the silver markers with the stars. You're allowed to come on in, sir. Uh, right here, now you go back to the 1850s, 1860s, you didn't have television, radio, internet, anything. The most popular form of getting the news out was newspapers. At that time, Memphis had six newspapers, okay? Small newspaper. Well, we had two up until 1983, you know, the day, afternoon, and night. And think about New York City probably had 20 newspapers in those afternoon specials or breaking news, extra... Well, the Memphis State Appeal, the Union strategy in the Civil War was number one, get control of the Western Rivers. You control the ports of the Western Rivers, which is Tennessee, Cumberland, and Mississippi. You control the troop and supply movement on this western part of the theater. Uh, so the Anaconda Plan, they snaked around from the south, uh, around Florida, up through New Orleans this way. Coming around from the north, they, the fleet came down from New Madrid, Fort Pillow, Randolph, and on June 6, 1862, 5,000 citizens sat on the banks over here and watched the Naval Battle of Memphis. If it was an NFL football game or a fireworks show, they were shooting each other in the river, not on the banks. No buildings were ever fired on here. No buildings were burned. Uh, that battle lasted 90 minutes, but it was the largest inland naval battle in the history of the world. It occurred right here, June 6, 1862. Well, the second strategy for the Union, once you get control of the city, you get control of the newspapers to control whether you want to say propaganda, whatever you want circulated out there. And so if you didn't cooperate with the federal government, they would throw your press or your type into the river. You're out of business. You couldn't print handbills or anything, regular daily business. Because a lot of those were printing, because again, there wasn't TV, radio for ads and stuff like that. So one newspaper, The Appeal, which later became The Commercial Appeal, which we have today, said, we, we gonna stand with the South. They loaded up their presses from here in this alley, went down to Grenada, Mississippi, then to Jackson, then over to uh, Atlanta, Montgomery, Columbus. Three years, three states, a thousand miles, the moving appeal. Uh, always printing the southern angle of this war, one step of the head of the Union occupation through the war. Uh, General Sherman hated the appeal newspaper uh, because they, they, they'd take over a city and they'd, the generals would pick up an inkwet copy of the newspaper. John Reed McClanahan would stay at that post as long as he could, outrunning the Union occupation all around. John Reed McClanahan's buried in Elmwood with, along with uh, Benjamin Franklin Dill and America Carolina Dill. It's a great story over there. Uh, to hear all about all this, uh, and they became very popular in the South. Other news, you know, it's like the USA Today being in the city. They weren't competing with the local news. USA Today doesn't do that. Well, now they do, but, <laughs> but uh, used to. So they were welcomed into those cities. Here's the story, the, the appeal, Southern news. Uh, come on, General Sherman, get the, get the appeal because he just, it rallied the Southerners to the cause. It was the Bible of the Confederacy, that, um, that damn rebel rag is what they called it. You know, they had all sorts of nicknames for it. And eventually got caught in 1865 in April in Columbus or Macon. Uh, the type was thrown in the river there. The, the press was saved, put on a wagon to Chattanooga. From Chattanooga on a barge back to Memphis, and by November of 1865, he was back open again. So the commercial appeal has about a five-month gap they weren't publishing in their lifetime, 177 years now. They started republishing again. Tooth, SC Tooth, was working for the commercial appeal at the time. We're going to go down to the Tooth building in a minute, and he's the one that helped load the presses on here uh, to get them on out of town. So the moving appeal, that's a, that's a great story there. Come right here. This is this is uh, my favorite alley, by the way. If you start down at Union Avenue, go to court. This is a treasure trove of manhole covers in here. Very old manhole, very ornate manhole covers. This is the one. They call it Center Alley or Center Lane now. It ought to be Jimmy Ogle Alley. Make that happen. I'll come back for that. Uh, let's come right out here and see the Hugh Hotel. Let's stand. Y'all stand right here. Have that as my background, Hugh. Can you hold that for me? Man? I'm wagging that around. Hugh Hotel 
Uh, this building was built, I think, in 1904, 1906. Four. 1904. At that time, it was the tallest building in Memphis. I think it was 16 stories tall. It was the Tennessee Bank and Trust Building. Again, there were eight different banks between front and fourth down here. Okay, this is where banking met cotton. This Madison Avenue. I'll tell you in a few minutes some stats about it when you get away from this noise. Uh, then, as we changed in the 1970s, 1980s, early 2000s, it became the um, the Madison was the name of the hotel, a very upscale hotel. Uh, then, and this recently in the last year, it's changed its name to Hugh. So it's been a great upscale luxury hotel comparable to the Peabody, let's say, here. And why the name Hugh? Well, somebody said, well, some Chinese guy came in here and invested in it. Well, name up some famous. Well, Hugh, period, is actually Hugh, Hugh, H-U-G-H, L. Brinkley. And he, when he, and he is the grandson of John Overton the son of Ann Overton, who is John's son's daughter, uh, John Overton's daughter, who Anzale's named for. I mean, we get this, the Overtons, the Snowdens, the Brinkleys, the Todds, all of a sudden all these names, and Byards and all these names start interchanging. So he was the, the son of Robert Brinkley, who built the first Peabody Hotel, who built railroads, who helped finish the railroad from Charleston to Memphis, uh, built the first Peabody Hotel in 1869, the Brinkley Plaza building right over here, it's named for him. It, then, it, then he, of course, passed away, and, and the Peabody moved over to Second in Union in 1925. Uh, became a Lowenstein's, and then, uh, and then became Brinkley Plaza after Lowenstein's went away, a uh, office building. This uh, Hugh here, um, he had finished the railroad at a very young age to Little Rock, like in the 1870s. He was like 30 years old when that happened, and, uh, and uh, he was trying to manage his wife's estates. Uh, so. He also got Jay Gould's son to be involved in building railroads out in this area of the country. It's a big railroad building time. So if you know the area named the Beltline, that's the right there past the parkways, right where the, the viaduct goes over on Summer and Union and Walnut Grove, that's the Beltline coming around. Because the city was expanding in 1899, we expanded all the way to where Overton Park is. The lands for Overton Park's built are bought in 1901, you see. So the city is moving east. So they build the Beltline out there to help move all these, we're nine different train depots at that time, you know, in, in downtown Memphis. Built a huge railroad center, so he got the Beltline built. Uh, he was a very giving person for the YWCA. Uh, the Lucy Brinkley Hospital was formed and named for his wife that had passed away. And that eventually became the Methodist Hospital, you see. So there's a lot of neat stories about Hugh Brinkley, but for some reason at a young age, he wanted to be Hugh, period, H-U, rather than H-U-G-H, L, period, Brinkley. That's where, and of course, when they were building that railroad over to Arkansas, uh, that to like where the I guess White River is, you know. And before they had it finished, uh, you would have to. And same thing with with uh, the highway, you'd have to stop, get out of your car, or get on a ferry to go across the river, or get the train across the river by ferry, or you got to go by stagecoach or something like that. But to get to Arkansas, it took like three or four different ways of transportation until they got all the bridges finished and all that. So the stop over there, about 80 miles over, 60 miles over was called Panley because that's where all the workers stopped and they were so hungry uh, at night they would lick the pans clean they called it Panlick Arkansas and it finally got changed to Brinkley Arkansas that's the formation of Brinkley Arkansas named for Brinkley here the Brinkley family bet you didn't know that huh? <laughs> so goofy but that's how important getting railroads through here uh, from Charleston to the river and then trying to get through the swamps of Arkansas was not very with the Delta still flooding no levees and all that till the 1930s it was very difficult so he was a great achiever. And that's why the name Hugh, a Memphian, a grandson of our founder, not some Oriental guy. You know, most, most people like the Oriental story. Who, who Brinkley? <laughs> guy, come on this one. So the Hugh has expanded into this building, brought their diner over here onto Main Street Presence, got a meeting hall back there. So they kind of got this quarter block taken up pretty good here. Uh, they had to get some, had to relocate some people out of here. A little consternation about that, but. Uh, it's a better place. Uh, we're right here at Maine and Monroe, uh, Maine and Madison, excuse me, of course. You see the trolley lines now, but 100 years ago there were trolleys, streetcars, we call them in, going up and down here. You see pictures, 29 streetcars here at one time, you know, ironclad and all that. Then finally in the 1940s or so, we went to rubber tire trolleys uh, or cars. All the rails got pulled up. In the uh, 1976, the Mid America Mall was here, dedicated by President Ford a longest pedestrian mall in the country from the convention center down to Peel Street, let's say. Uh, didn't really bring anybody back downtown to shop or anything to this day, let's say, even in the, uh, let's see, 1993 is when this trolley line opened uh, 
from a federal grant, 85% federal grant. It's been very popular. It's not a real good people mover, but uh, it, what it is at a casual pace, and during the Memphis and May times or ball game times, you have people get on all these trolleys and they scale it up, and that's good to get parking dispersed out downtown. Uh, and it's a, it's a good thing for families and things like that. People love it. Uh, of course, they had some problem with the maintenance. It was closed for a couple of years, reopened last year, and the loop didn't reopen yet. And then the Madison line came in 2005. Hopefully, they'll get that back open out to Cleveland area, not all the way to over the square, but at least to the Cleveland area soon. And so as you look at me down here, this was four big, like you see a mall, big anchor stores, and then all the little stores in between in the middle of the 20th century, classic downtown area, Goldsmiths, Lowenstein's, Breeze, Gerber's, and then every tie store, shoe store, whatever you can imagine in between, and little cafes and restaurants. And look, they got outdoor dining right here, counter right there. They can open those windows up. That's pretty cool. Uh, one of the funny things right here, so you can stand right here. You can also stand over in Court Square, and you can see the tallest building in Memphis as it became the tallest building in Memphis. Uh, over 10 stories high. So the very first one is a DT Porter building, and that was in like 1895 or 1890. Uh, it's a Continental Loan building, and the big deal about it was the one with the mural right here, uh, overlooking Court Square, is it was uh, steel framed structures. It wasn't load bearing walls of bricks like these other small buildings are. You can only go up so high with them. Then it becomes like the game Jenga. You know, they start, you know, going back and forth. So steel frame all the way up. 10 stories high, it's all the rage in construction. So you don't need to put windows in the south side or the east side because you don't want to look out the windows to another building. So there's only windows in the west side and north side looking at the river and Court Square. Well, they didn't build any buildings back behind it, so they put a nice mural here. In the, that mural's from the uh, 1976. That's an old mural there. Well, it did do something about that sometime soon. They did add some windows in on the east side when they renovated the building in the 1980s for condos. It's named the D.T. Porter Building because he was one of our presidents of the taxing district in the, during the yellow fever years when we lost our charter. Uh, he had died, and he left $150,000 behind in his will for his family to build a memorial for him. They bought that building and put his name on it. So be careful where you put your money. So <laughs> eight to 1890, 11 stories. Oh, it had an elevator that went all the way to the top. People paid 10 cents to ride the elevator. It was the tallest elevator at the time. Were afraid to go down, so they walked down, you know. Uh, beautiful building. Uh, so you turn and look at the Hugh building, that 16 stories, 1904. You look at the green top building right here, the Exchange Building, 1910, 19 stories. Then you can turn, you can see the Lincoln American Tower right there with the green roof and the flag. 22 stories, 1924. He lives there. He owns it. 1930, look at the yellow building down here, the Steric Building. Uh, 29 stories. Then 1965, the next tallest building is the 100 North Main Building. So that's your tallest buildings in Memphis, the whole city, as they became the tallest building in Memphis. And we'll get down, we'll talk about that area in a little while. Court Square. Obviously, it's right there, one of our original four squares in Memphis. And let's cross right now. Come on. Oh, time out. Stop right here. Look at Walgreens. This way. 1934, the first, op uh, first open, uh, oh, what do they call it? Op open eye door, what do they call it? Open eye door. The first electric eye door, electric eye door in Memphis is right here. 1934 to Walgreens. He walked up to it and it opened up. I'm automatic. It had to happen sometime. Happened right there. 1934. So you can see no windows in that building up there on either side. Put those ones down the center. Uh, here we are on the very, very wonderful November the 6th Street, which is an alley that starts at Beale and ends at Shadyac Street in the Pinch District, 17 blocks long through here. Uh, it was formerly Maiden Lane, and in 1934, on November the 6th, our city voted to join TVA Power, so we named this November the 6th, 1934 Street in honor of that. Okay, that was a big deal as we're trying to get all the utilities under one roof in Memphis, which finally happened in 1939 when Memphis Light, Gas, and Water was formed. That's the largest three service, multi purpose utility under one roof in America. Okay, MLGNW. That's where this starts at, right down there. Gets blocked in a couple of places. Somebody rudely built a building in the alley there, got a quick claim deed. Gets blocked here beautifully by Court Square and the Hebe Fountain. 
uh, down this way. Then again, it gets blocked by the buildings there going north. It's blocked by the interstate and the federal buildings. It comes and goes. The 17 block tour ends up being a 27 block tour when you got to go back and forth all the time. But it's the spine. This is the spine of downtown. And my rules are giving talks in downtown Memphis. If I can see it, I can talk about it. So I can talk about it right there. That round thing on top of that building right there, didn't that building open in 1965? I was 12 years old. I put my swimming suit on out in East Memphis, ride a bus downtown to swim in the swimming pool on the next to the top floor up there. And they go eat lunch at the top of the 100 Club. And it revolved around like this, one revolution in an hour, about four miles an hour. That was really cool until we found a swimming pool closer to home, you know, it's okay. Uh, but it, it was part of trying to bring downtown back. Office building that offices went away five years ago, eight years ago, they started trying to deliberately empty it out so they could convert it to another use, either residential or hotel. So right now it's caught up in, do we build another modern hotel tower there at Civic Center Plaza? Do we redo this one? Now you got everybody fighting about that, the two different companies, because the incentives on both ones. And of course, here comes the Sheraton Hotel, which is already the convention center. Wait a minute, we've been here, we need some breaks too. So now you got like three things fighting over, which is a good thing to have, people fighting over hotel rooms, because we need ho big hotel rooms in downtown Memphis. Conventions need 400, 600 rooms in one spot, or 1,200 rooms right close to each other, rather than in 12 different 100 room Ho you know, hotels, you see. So that, we got to do something about that. That's going to happen. So there's beautiful Court Square. This building actually fell down. So you can kind of see on the building behind it, the uh, whatever color that is. See those square? Those are like anchors in there to help. You'll see stars in some of the buildings all around and stuff. That helps anchor those Jenga bricks <laughs> by rods going through to tighten them up and keep the walls together without them expanding out. This, uh, again, November the 6th, 1934 Street, to, my, and, to mine and Robert's uh, research. It's the only street in America named after a month, a day, and a year. We're trying to get 1934 put back on the sign for that very effect. Uh, there's no July 4th, 1776 Street in Boston or Philadelphia when we became America, or July 20th, that 1969 in Houston or Cape Canaveral when we landed on the moon. When somebody won the Super Bowl or when Willie got married or something, you know, some big event, it's when Memphis voted to join TVA Power. What? So we need to put that back on there. 17 signs is all we ask. All this money we got around town, you know. Let's go on down to 2nd Street here. So here's kind of a funny thing. You know, you see the Falls, the Falls building over there and the U and building is a V. And people always ask about that. Why did they do that? I mean, obviously, if you can make a B, you can make a U. If you can make a D, you can make a U. And I, some architect explained that to me at that time. That alphabet somebody was using only had 24 letters. They didn't have the U. So they used the V instead. I could believe that. I don't, but I could believe that. I don't have any other explanation. So, cha-ching. <laughs> He's going to find out on the next tour. That's his fault. But Central Bank, so no, obviously another bank right here. You see, and of course, nice plaque right here. Uh, Goodwin Institute, of course, uh, Cossack Goodwin Institute. Mr. Cossack gave a lot of money for the, for the library to be built, but they didn't give enough money to buy any books. So they had to go have a fundraising drive to buy books and put in the library back in 1895. But the Cossack Goodwin Lecture Series, the Goodwin part of it, this is the Goodwin building, right? Uh, the Goodwin part, uh, he was an attorney. Oh, he was a cotton man, too back at the turn of the century, early part of the century. And the oddity about him being buried over at Elmwood, he and his wife outlived all nine of their children who died like from age 10 to age 30. You go in their little area over there near the Civil War area and see the good ones and there's all their children. And look at that, the ages and dates on that. That's kind of neat or whatever. Looking right here at the Exchange Building, on this site formerly was a building built in the 1880s. There's was about six stories, very ornate. And so the Cotton Exchange uh, moved over. This building was built in 1910, and then eventually the Cotton Exchange moved over to Front Street in 1924 to be closer to the cotton businesses. This is the Merchants Exchange as well. A lot of uh, businesses in here. Let me see that thing right there. Uh, yeah, hold, uh, hold, hold that, hold that. So I went to the 1955 phone book going up and down Madison Avenue here, and I found this from Front Street down to Danny Thomas. You can see this about eight block era, right? Area. There were, in the phone book, 422 attorneys in this area. There were 21 shoe stores on Madison Avenue between Front 
eight barbers, 20 architects, 13 clothing stores, 14 jewelers, uh, Goodman used to have a sign there a long time, uh, 63 dentists, 23 restaurants, 11 brokers, seven dental labs, mostly in the Hickman building, the medical arts building, the Hickman building, that's now the Commonwealth building, uh, from front to basically bash right past the YMCA in 1955. That's how, again, 1949 when Poplar Plaza opened. So everything up through the 1950s was in downtown. You came downtown. You know, we weren't living past, much past Goodland or White Station going to the east or, or below Nonconna Creek or below Wolf River, really. Everything was coming right into here from the 150 mile area, not just Memphis, but you think about the whole Delta. This is the banking, cultural, shopping, governmental, social, music, whatever, whatever, automobile row, all these things uh, in this area for a 150 mile era, area, not just Memphis, downtown Washington. But that just tells you a lot was going on through here. Some of the restaurants that you know, some of the names are Anderton's, Britland's, Pappy and Jimmy started here, Piccadilly was here. I ate Piccadilly the other day. People's uh, Billiards was down here, and Denstool's was right, right there. In that corner, Denstool's, you know, Candy's moving on out. But everybody's kind of started moving on out. Belmont was over there by where MLG and W is now, they're out in East Memphis, you know, and stuff like that. All right, come on this way. Historical marker for my sesquicentennial 50 years ago. Unfortunately, Willie really can't get around here and take the backside of what this looked like, because some enterprising young historian man came through this past year and repainted this thing to make it look nice like this after 50 years. I will not reveal to you who that person was. It was Batman. But there's been about 15 of these redone like this in downtown Memphis. This tells you that after uh, Nashville fell, the archives for the Tennessee legislator were held here in Memphis. They thought that was a big deal here to have a whole historical marker here during that time. But there's still a series of sesquicentennial markers from 1969, like the first tavern or the first courthouse. Uh, the first telephone call, you'll see there's about 12 of them left. I don't know how many they originally put out, but every 12, all 12 of them have been repainted this year during the Sesquicentennial Centennial Center and some other ones around. So that's a very interesting project to get involved in. Let's, we're going to go around this way. Jordan, come here, hand me my paper again. We're going to walk down to Stereo Alley. Uh, back in the, in the alleyways of downtown Memphis, uh, there's a lot of great names. I did a whole newspaper story about that last year. Uh, this is Stereo Alley, K-L-Y-X Stereo Alley, because K-L-Y-X was a radio station in here in the 1960s. And there was a movement 60 years ago to beautify the alleys, because at that time you didn't have dump beautiful dumpsters or compactors, but a lot of trash just piling up out here from restaurants and rats and people getting into it. It's just a litter fest. So it was a big effort to beautify the alleys in downtown Memphis. So, well, they weren't making any trash at a radio station other than a few papers like this. And, uh, so they put speakers out in the alley, and they were beautifying the alley with music being played in that, which is a great idea, and that's why they call it KLYX Stereo Alley. Isn't that nice? Now, with today's technology, Wi-Fi and all that, and these little inexpensive speakers you could put out in several places in downtown Memphis, we ought to honor them by going to several places throughout downtown and putting these remote speakers up and having different genres of Memphis music playing, not loud or anything, just ambiently as you go through downtown. Other cities do that. Uh, you go up to Covington and, and Ripley and you go to the town square there, there's a speaker about this big <laughs> out there in the town square. And they're playing a the local radio station ads and everything, just having music in the square. It's cool when you're out there. But there's a way I think we can do that to, to add more to the ambience and give Stereo Alley credit. Now, what you see, what's going on here now, you see a new surface. You, you know, we've walked through enough alley surfaces in Memphis uh, that it's bad. This is called, I think it's called Bowmanite is the surface. So what they do, they put the black asphalt looking type material down and while it's still hot, they'll press it. You'll see this on Beale Street now. When Beale Street first opened, they had a, a layer of sand. They put paper bricks down there. Then here comes the first beer delivery truck and all starts sinking. And not, so then they put concrete down in the bricks and the bricks pavers are chip. So Beale Street is now Bowmanite like this. There's several alleys like this, but it kind of looks old and authentic, not to be an individual brick. It's going to be a better, sturdier surface. Uh, like I say, you see the old in the new here now. You still see the old granite curves they kept for the tax credits. They're, these curves are probably a foot and a half deeper right here. It's a big old slab like this. Boom, six inches wide, six feet long, about 24 to 30 inches deep. And that's how you did curbing before you had poured in place concrete. They had the granite curves, individual, all through downtown, you'll see it everywhere. Um, 
like the glass bricks on the wall there. The twinkle, the lights are new. Today at 5 o'clock, which might as well mention, we're right here on August 10th, 2019. We'll be dedicating what's called the artery. The artery. This is out of the downtown magazine. The artery is probably, look, right there, is that? <laughs> Y'all buy it. Let's do it right here. Here's the artery of the magazine. Downtown has been around since 1991. Jody Vance gave her credit for that. So there are uh, about 10 different art installations, different artists. Let's just go ahead and mention them. Uh, A&M Creative, Javon Bullock, Kaleeb Elkins, Brandon Marshall, Jason Miller, Carl E. Moore, Angela Myers, Darlene Newman, Carl Scott, Lance Turner, Franklin Wallace, Melissa Wilkinson, Kara Woods, and Yancey Villa. That's more than 10, but it starts here at 2nd Street. It goes, it's going to wrap around, go all the way down to basically Monroe, I believe, uh, to Escape Alley, which is right where the Charlie, where Charlie Vargas Rendezvous Alley is, in the, right there, and then back to 2nd, I believe it is. So it's a wrap around like this, a new way. If you don't want to walk down the sidewalks and hear the motorcycles and buses, and you can kind of walk through here and look at some of the artwork. Obviously, there's going to be a party tonight to open this up. Back in the 1980s and 90s, we had the Sleep Out Louis Alley parties over there and have, have 500 people in that alley for parties. So have a band down at one end, beer and food at the other end, and people in the middle having a party. They did that with Barbaro Alley a couple years ago. They've done that. So this is a series of Downtown Memphis Commission cleaning up, painting up, fixing up, and putting artwork in the alleys. And it's called the Artery. So it is an artery, a new artery, and it's got the word art in it. I think that's pretty cool. You know. Now if we get the new people to learn how to park their scooters, and their cars, not illegally. See, that's what you're going to have the challenge. You got all these good intentions by the planners, and it's up to the users to come do what they want to do sometimes, you know. And that's how it always is in parks and recreation and open spaces. And I think the planners try to do their best to, to make the areas accessible and enjoyable and clean and safe and all that. Then the human's going to come along and do what they want to do anyway. That's, that's a safety hazard right there to emergency if there's a fire or something, and just shouldn't be parking bumper to bumper to bumper. But anyway. Let's go this way. Now, as we look down the artery to the south, there's the Peabody Hotel. It's always been great to be able to look down this alley and see that big Peabody Hotel sign at night, you know. So uh, this alley is, gosh, this is Maggie Isbell Alley, isn't it, right? It goes from Monroe all the way to Adams. Maggie Isbell was a seamstress in downtown in the last century, about 50 years. And when she passed away, some of the People that uh, patronized her business and the lawyers and stuff, getting their suits cleaned up and fixed, thought they ought to dedicate this alley to her longevity of down to Maggie Isbell. Uh, and then from Union to Monroe, or from Monroe to Union, it's Charlie Vergus Rendezvous Alley. <laughs> Everybody knows the 1970s, if you were caught in downtown Memphis, you were the little lost or looking for the rendezvous, you know, because he's been there since 1948 and a big downtown proponent all those years. So you can kind of see now, we come wrap around here. So cars in there, a little bit narrow, Artwork really helps out, right? You get to here, it's a little bit wider, a sidewalk's wider, downhill, slope, and at the lights. This is a very, to me, looking to the, this is the first time I've looked at this kind of finish now. Uh, it's gonna make people improve their backsides, <laughs> you know? Uh, again, it's a great effort. Obviously, it's set up for a party. But now, let's turn and look here real quick. This isn't on Madison Avenue. Golly, construction going on there for another hotel, right? Mm -hmm. Look right here, Hotel Indigo. This, now this is an example in the 1950s. This structure right here, parking structure built for a steric building and a Holiday Inn put on top of it. That was a Holiday Inn when this building was built during that time. Guess then again in the 1950s, so there was four built within a year. One on South Bellevue, which is Highway 51 South, South 3rd, Highway 61 South, North 3rd, Highway 51 North up there, Tom, Thomas and Watkins, and then Summer, the first one. He built four real quick in one year, then started he got all four corners of the city, so to speak. And then he got this. This was a Holiday Inn. This just got dedicated this week, Hotel Indigo. Uh, it's a, a brand around the country, Hotel Indigo. And there's going to be a, there's a, oddly, there's a uh, restaurant here called Third and Court. But it's actually at B.B. King and Court. So <laughs> maybe they couldn't use the name B.B. King and Court or something. But, but it's Third and Court because that used to be Third Street right there. Uh, that's right in the building right there. <clears throat> and the, the, uh, uh, Building right here, I call it the Columbus Building. I forget the name. I call it German, German, German building. But I call it because the Knights of Columbus was in there for a long time. But look at all the nice trim and ornamentation. You go to the east side, all the windows are out on the east side. They're renovating it now too. So one, two, wow. three, boom, boom, boom. This parking lot won't be a parking lot like this in five years. I think there'll be a building in here. 
And you look at the building right there, uh, the black glass building there built in 1985. It opened as one Memphis place, way ahead of its time. They could get anybody to occupy it, so they started calling it one empty place, <laughs> as we do around here. And then they put the bankruptcy courts in there, and it filled up like that, because we lead the country in bankruptcy filings, you know. <laughs> they also call it, they call it the Darth Vader building, because it's black glass like that. So this, this would be great to come back in five and 10 years and take another snapshot if there's not a building right here to see the completion of all this right in here and the usage of this alley. This area is going, look at the backsides of these buildings here as composed to the backside of this right here and how much nicer this is just because of the alley treatment to me and still keeping some of the oldest manhole covers we got in Memphis, 1901, Willie. Memphis Telephone Company. Right here is Bell South. And I bet you within 20 feet you'll find, we'll find a Western Union Telegraph. There were, back in the early 1900s, there were three different phone companies in Memphis because we didn't have one national exchange. And if you wanted to have, talk to all your friends, you had to have three different phones, three different phone lines, and three different numbers in your house, and you couldn't talk to your own self in your own house until all that got consolidated. And that's what said. The oldest manhole cover I found or cover in downtown Memphis is 1884. That's up there in the Pinch District, right where old T.J. Mulligans used to be, J.F. Frank, who's buried at Elmwood. Uh, 1901 is the next oldest I found. This, there's one like this just down at uh, Union and Wagner, too. That's where we start our manhole cover, too. We start with the 1901. So we're going to sneak around this fence here and not do anybody any harm. Come on this way. We'll get back on Madison Avenue. Burp, his name is Park. Madison Avenue Park. Yeah, it just they didn't get a name. Yeah, it just didn't get, I thought they were going to put it. I know it's top Gallery down there underneath. Yep. Back on Madison Avenue. Uh, not a lot of streetscape this. Burger King used to be here back in the 80s and 90s, as I recall. And I think before that time, this is where might have been one of the original locations of the Cupboard restaurant as they moved, they moved over to Monroe later on. Uh, but several years ago, some owners of uh, Brass Store and around this area saw that the building was going down. They thought they'd make us a little gathering area. Madison Avenue Park is the creative name uh, that I couldn't think of. Uh, but you, if you look, you see there's going to be seating in there. They can actually show movies up against the ball. you got a patch of green. It's not necessarily a dog park, let's say. And you come on, as this alley goes down to Floyd Alley, then to Monroe, then to Madison, that's where you pick up more artwork. And as it turns to go back to second, that's where you pick up the rest of the artwork for the artery. Because this is the artery like this. So, again, the trees in here, the benches. And then there's changing exhibits down in Topps Gallery down there. If you go, see where it says tops? Right in there. If you walk right inside there, it's a glassed off area where they have exhibits. He also has an exhibit place up there on Hewling where the Jack Robinson gallery is, but you gotta go down in the basement of a business. This is the smallest, most unknown little art gallery there is in Memphis, Topps Gallery, cause he liked Topps Barbecue. That's what he told me. So that's kind of a neat little thing right in there. And then of course the rendezvous. Looking right here at the first Tennessee bank building, which was built as the first national bank building. Now, you can hold that for me. First, first uh, national bank, when you think about it, during the Civil War, Memphis was the untouched town because of the naval battle under strict Union occupation. Business was so good here, both North and South, that first national bank opened in Memphis in, 19, in 1864, the 14th oldest bank charter in America. That's great insight right there, you see, right here in downtown Memphis. Changed its name in the 1970s to First Tennessee Bank. So the Sterrick Building's built in 1930, there's not another skyscraper over 20 stories tall built in downtown Memphis for 34 years because of the Depression, World War II, and post-World War II suburbanization of our community until this building was built in 1964. It's not taller than the Steric. The Hunter North Main Building is taller in 1965, so that's our sequence there. But First Tennessee obviously has a great impact in this community, this whole state. Uh, if you go into the lobby there, we can't take cameras into the lobby. When you go to where the teller counters are, the big long line of teller counters, all the First Tennessee Heritage collections on the wall there, scenes from all across the state of Tennessee. Uh, there's a whole bunch of artwork inside there. I mean, it's a, you know, Andrew Jackson and, and uh, I don't know if Little Debbie's there or not. I get confused when we do our, our, our fourth graders do all these famous Davy Crockett, uh, Dragon Canoe, people like that are, are, are depicted up there. Andrew Jackson, like I said, and relief. It's really neat. It's really beautiful. And then there's artwork all in the lobby there too. So it's worth you if you're downtown sometime, just go in there for the air conditioning. And there's an ATM and there's a little deli too. And look around at that artwork. It's really neat. But you don't you're not allowed to bring cameras into banks. Because you think you're casing the joint, you know. All right, come this way. 
Saturday Night Jamboree, when you start talking about WDIA in Memphis and WHER and WHBQ and KWAM or KWEM, all the beginning of music blowing out through the Delta. Uh, well, there was a, a here, Joe Manuel, Larry Manuel's one that brought, his son, Joe, brought this uh, marker to us through the Tennessee Historical Commission. Uh, but there were shows here in the auditorium back in the 1950s, broadcast on Saturday nights over KWEM, which is now KWAM. The, the transmitter's over in Arkansas. The offices are now in Memphis over here. Uh, but you had people like Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Johnny and Dorsey Burnett, Burnett Barbara Pittman, Eddie Bond, Charlie Feathers, Larry Manuel, Lloyd Arnold McCullough, Bud Deckelman, and Harmonica Frank Ford were some of the names that played over that. But Elvis played over the radio here. Uh, Carl Perkins, you come around. This is a different text on this side right here. Uh, Goodwin Institute Building Auditorium is the home of the Saturday Night Jamboree. So that's how a lot of those performers got to perform over the air, you know. Or Elvis, you know, his first big public concert was at the Odin Park Shell. But, you know, and it went until 1956, he got on TV, you know. In 1956, in December, he's out in Shreveport, the, uh, the well, no, the uh, Louisiana Hayride down there at a Shreveport Auditorium. And that was like two months after he'd been on TV, and he was wildly popular then. He was on in the middle of the show, though, because when he was booked, it was before all that. And that's when, when he, he got off the stage, the police place is going nuts. And that's where the guy finally came up with the phrase, Elvis has left the building. That's where that started down there. Because they're trying to get the people to sit down and shut up. We got more acts to go here. So that started being used all over the place. 1956. But this is the era where we're trying to get music from being just public performance in a, in a juke joint, in a bar, in a park, in a shell, onto radio, and then later on to TV. And of course, dance party, talent party in Memphis. And you got all the shows, Shindig, Hullabaloo, and all that, where the action is in the 60s. But trying to translate all that energy and sound and getting it mic right and all that stuff, some of that happened here. And uh, I mean, people, uh, rockabilly music is just crazily popular over in Europe to this day. There are a lot of websites. Joe Manuel's like a, a big name over there, according to Larry, his son. Uh, so people like coming and taking pictures. Another marker here in downtown Memphis with Elvis on it, so it gets every Elvis fan over here taking a picture too. Marion Scudder Griffin. Uh, she's buried in Elwood, isn't she? I keep on plugging Elwood here. Here we have the Soul of the City this year, in October. Uh, she was refused uh, the ability to have to practice law in the state of Tennessee. Again, women didn't have the right to vote from 1848 to 1920. That took 72 years, and finally Tennessee got that passed. She finally got it, admitted to ask laws, and then she got in the legislature, uh, and then uh, first woman elected to Tennessee House of Representatives. And for many years, she she fought for women causes. You know, Marion Scudder Griffin. They were wanting, they were, they, were, they were getting to a time crunch on getting that marker installed. And they said, well, let's take this one down and put uh, Saturday Night Jamboree there. I went, uh-uh. <laughs> with the law, Baker, the largest law firm in Tennessee right there, with her being a female lawyer. This is like five years ago. So I said, look, I'll help you get that one built down there if you get, to get them to get permission to drill the hole in the sidewalk. We don't need to touch Marion Scudder Griffin. Now, this is five years. This is ancient history. Five, what's happened the last two years? of us going around and identifying over 200 places in Memphis has a women's, a woman's name on it, like Elmer Field Fieldhouse, or Kenea Crenshaw Library, Market Polk to Memphis Bell, or Brass Notes on Beale Street, all around historical markers like this, murals, Ida B. Wells is in six murals in Memphis all around. So we have a whole list of over 200 names of women all over the place, schools, and Memphis Area Women's Council, Women of Achievement, now W-H-E-R, the first all-female station, and Marion Keisker. Uh, that was dedicated yesterday. There's a trail for that. Just, like you can go around and do a blues trail in Memphis or a Civil War trail or a heritage trail in the African-American history in the south part of town. You can now take the women's history trail. There's, there's an app and a map that takes you from the University of Memphis down to Elmwood, South Memphis, downtown, back into Midtown. And we dedicated, we got that done this year with some good hard work from some women promoting womenofachievement.org. Since 1985, there's over 250 women have been put in Women of Achievement for seven different categories like courage and determination and history and heritage and vision and steadfastness and one other. Uh, and it's uh, uh, every, all, uh, every March, there's an annual induction of seven new names in there. Uh, and from women from all walks of life, they don't necessarily have their name on a marker or something. They could be in research or some other cause. Marion Keisker got put on a marker. She was in the, Women of Achievement in, in uh, 2001, because like I mentioned her earlier, she had uh, also had been the first uh, female captain in the Armed Forces Network 
in Germany, uh, the largest television network in the world at the time. Before that time, she had been on WHER, the first voice on WHER. Before that time, she was Miss Kitty Kelly for 10 years on WREC. Before that time, she worked for Sam Phillips at Sun Studio and kept Elvis there until Sam said, okay, we can do something with him. And then she came back and was founder of the Now Chapter in Memphis and desex to classified ads in Memphis. So people like that who you know maybe from Sun Studio or a humble beginning and people like it, you don't hear the stories unless you see historical markers. And we, we add to our history by adding, we add to it by not subtracting. In the last couple of years, we're trying to fill in the gaps of what we haven't covered properly over the last hundred years in our African-American history and our women's history. I know we can get a vote for that in this group right here, can't we? Speaking to the choir. Let's turn around. Well, we don't turn. Well, he's got to turn around now. Look at that exterior building real quick. Right there was Napoleon Hill's house. If you look at the old pictures of Napoleon Hill's house, it looks like something out of a Citizen Kane Xanadu or whatever. It's just a weird castle, all these turrets and spires and everything right there. He was the merchant prince of Memphis on banks, on cotton, back in the 1870s through the 1920s, let's say. That's where his house was right there. This building was built in 1903 and when we get around to the side you see the turrets up there in the third level windows but when we get around to the Madison Avenue side you'll see his initials in the turrets N and H because he was like to look at his initials in the building they'd built uh, this was uh, built uh, MLG and W was there for a long time uh, gosh commercial appeal oh, the press cemetery was here for a long time before we moved out to Union Avenue uh, the appeal I mean the MLG and W was here in the middle of the century up till 1970 before it moved over to Main Street uh, then it was office building up until about five years ago, started running out of office space. About three years ago, it became Hotel Napoleon, named for Napoleon Hill, not that other Napoleon from wherever, France. Insignificant Napoleon to us. Uh, kind of like we got a Christopher Columbus statue here in Memphis. When did he come to Memphis? Uh, so that's a, now a very nice boutique hotel. Again, we have so many boutique hotels in Memphis. People are not building boutique hotels in Memphis now. The ones that are being built right now, it's going to be a little bit, you know, flooding the market, so to speak. It's got to catch up with the, the business. Of course, Airbnbs and stuff like that and Ubers are changing the way people travel now and the big change and all that. So we have a lot of good alternatives here for hotels. And when you go in here, come up here sometime in the afternoon and go into the bar there. They got bound volumes of the, of the press cemeter in there, monthly volumes, like you see at the courthouse, just sitting out on the tables here. You open them up like from 1947 or something and flick through all the news. Just something to do in the afternoon. Okay? All right, let's... So the Sterrick building opening, it was... Uh, see, Governor Sterling and the architect was named Hedrick. So S-T-E-R of Sterling and the R-I-C of Hedrick became Sterling... Or uh, Sterrick. <laughs> Sorry, Sterrick building. That's, who, that's where the name came from. Kind of an unusual name. Gothic architects there, 29th. And this is where you start seeing what they call the canyon effect. Uh, you see the buildings built before that time are straight up. Like you go into New York City, there's a lot of places where the buildings are straight up. And then they want to start, also you can't see that the sun can't get down into the streets, you know. It's called the canyon effect. So you start setting offset. See how it's kind of offset as it goes up? It's called, they're trying to offset it so sunlight can come more into the downtown area. So you, that's kind of a little architectural or development term. Let's go, let's go with the... Light. Let's go with the light here. We'll talk about it over here. Well, this effort right here of these murals, these are about two years old, two or three years old. Again, you look around at some of the boarded up buildings in downtown Memphis, you got old, you know, weather beaten plywood and browning out and chipping off and spray painted on vandalism, you know, graffiti. And they've come in and tried to clean up this corner right here to make it look nicer. Historic figures like Mr. Crump, Robert Church Sr., other folks you just did say. Okay, okay. But I can't identify all the names in this. I think I got it written down somewhere because there was a story somewhere we got that. So the Sterrick Building is like 29 stories hall, had eight high-speed elevators, about 2,000 people working in it during that time. It was our Empire State Building. You know, a restaurant up there. If you look at the old phone books, it's all sorts of where there's governmental offices and shipping, just everything was in here. It's the cream of the crop in this building. Up until the 1960s and 70s, and as our city started expanding out to the suburbs, this took a hit. And then people said all these excuses why it can't be redeveloped is too, the ceilings are too low for, because it was, it was air conditioned units, you know, it wasn't central HVAC or is asbestos paint or lead based paint, asbestos tile. And Henry Grosner, now the oddity about this building, probably the biggest impediment to building is there is a land lease, landowners have a building lease. 
is a 99-year lease, and the, the terms when that lease expires 99 years later from 1929, so that'd be 2028. In nine years, this building's supposed to be in operating condition, turned back over to the landowners. You know, and now for years, we've been trying to get people involved or interested in the building. Let's don't wait till 2025. Let's start getting it done now. And you can see some of these buildings are coming back to life. 100 North Main Building was dragged, drained down intentionally. This one is seriously being looked at now from my confidential sources. Only reason why I know that is I've had to go speak at places and talking about our buildings in downtown Memphis, our history, two dinner, private dinner meetings trying to, I'm not trying to be a snake oil salesman, I'm just telling my story. This is the history of this area type of thing. As a lighthearted part of the dinner, you know, then they get to the serious business about financing and construction and what you have to do. But those myths of all those things being wrong with it are not, not an impediment. They can, uh, Henry Grosner, you want to find, he, run, he owns the, the Goodwin building, the 10 South Main building, about my age, young guy. Uh, but he'll tell you all the facts about it. He'll openly tell you, no, it's, it's, a, it's got good bones. It can be redeveloped with all those uh, impossible things to overcome. So it's just a matter of the right person at the right time and making the numbers work. And you see, that's where downtown Memphis gets involved with some of its creative facade financing and long-term loans and parking garages, like with Union Row and some of these other projects, you know. So, and these other projects, it's complicated. Taxpayers do take a hit. Business owners do take a hit in lieu of other things happening in other parts of the city, let's say, but this is a part of the overall growth in different areas of the city. We want this building occupied. I think everybody, I don't think I want it painted yellow again because it used to be white. If you remember some of the pictures, it was white. I don't know why that guy painted it yellow, but he did. 70s. Yeah, okay. Now let's look right over here at Hotel Napoleon. Look up in the windows, the bottom turrets. You got the N there, you got the H here. Napoleon Hill's initials in the building right there, N and H. Not very ornate, but they're in there. We got one more block to go here. Let's get going. This garage was built when AutoZone Park opened in 2000, you see, to accommodate some of that traffic. All right, so you see an alley like this hadn't been, hadn't been touched except for running a utility line 40 years, you know, rough gravel concrete, weeds. So this will be a target for the alley program later on too, I think, as we can, you know, they get money to do it, to get the Bowmanite in here, murals. So you can see the comparison between that project and what they're trying to do to clean up. Because alleys are functional alleys too with dumpsters and everything. Behind me is the press box, name that. It's a combination office and residential now in the last five years. Uh, that was the old Tooth building. You heard me say the name Tooth up here, SC Tooth. Well, when it came back after the Civil War, it, opened, it became the largest printing company in the South at the time, apparently, SC Tooth. Foot spelled backwards, Tooth. Uh, and then his grandson's Tooth Brown, who was on the board at Elman for a long time, but Grace Tooth, his daughter. Hey, 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 <laughs> see y'all tomorrow. Happy birthday! He turns 60 tomorrow. I'm doing a talk on a riverboat for him. See, small world. Bill Todd Jr. Lar Todd. Lar Todd was the director of Main Street Kaiba when they won the Main Street of the Year in, 19, in 2015 from Parade Magazine. And he worked for Tooth Printing Company. It's out in Kaiaville now. Uh, different, another name added to it. That's small, isn't it? But uh, so this is, uh, they named it Press Box to kind of put up with the press Tooth printing business and everything. Well, Tooth also owns some land down in White Haven and uh, Grace Moore, it was named for his daughter Grace. The land was named Graceland. And then Grace, and then later in 1939, she had married Dr. Moore, I believe it was, and they, that's why they named the house Graceland. Dr. Moore built the house, the big house you see Elvis living in now. So the name was already there. But it comes from Tooth Printing, and I. Little Elvis everywhere around here, isn't there? You know, that's kind of neat. Uh, let's, of course, this building right here, Willie, why don't you walk across the street and back just to get it? We won't, because we're going to just kind of, but he's just going to get the, the terrarium here. This was built in 1971. It was, it was by the architects of Memphis, AIA, given the uh, building of the decade. They awarded that. Of course, you're going through the mid-century modern phase, too, you know, uh, with this terrarium here. This, guy, this was the C&I Bank at the time. It had a drive through window back behind there. It's now the visible school about 10 years. You know, back 15 years ago, 
Chamber of Commerce had bought this building thinking they were going to move their offices from the Falls building into here. Uh, and then they decided they are going to tear it down. And somebody got, got kind of crazy on that because it's a mid-century modern jewel, let's say. Uh, so come on, maybe they'll let us in, I don't know. See if you can try to get in. If you want to come up, so the bank lobby was right here, and they had trees like this inside there. This was probably Tennessee's largest uh, terrarium. <laughs> and I have a friend, Susan Elliott, whose mother was the first female executive vice president for a bank in Memphis, a uh, grandmother that is, in here. And she would come down with her on Saturday afternoons and climb in the trees. And she was like eight years old while the mother was working when the bank was closed on Saturdays. You know, she had to climb. So this is Visible Music School. Nobody's here, really. But come up and look, and you can see the terrarium that was in here. They took it over. Now, Visible Music School started in Lakeland about 20 years ago. I was at the Rock and Soul Museum, and I got told, Vis Vis Visible Music School's coming to the Rock and Soul. I went, oh, no. What are we doing a bunch of blind kids here? You know, So they all came in. I thought they were all blinders. And I put the headsets on, put Willie Bully on, because everybody loves Willie Bully. No matter what shape of mind you're in, everybody loves Willie Bully. They just, you see these kids out there dancing with the headsets on. They weren't blind. It's just a name. But Ken Stort started that 20, 25 years ago. College course training here in the musical arts and production and everything. It's an incredible school. Moved down here. And then when he was down here, he looked, hey, you think we can get part of that building over there be, for, be our dormitories? Looking at the Steric building. I went, that's a big chew to bite off right there. So you look around on this side, there's actually dormitories built down here now. And they got some other kids in dormitories on down Madison. So this is a really, a, a, one in Dallas, one in Chicago. Uh, I got to do a whatever, a podcast of some kind did in the Memphis Music Store. They filmed me from here and it went to Chicago and Dallas schools and classrooms one time. I did my whole Memphis Music Story from here one time last year. So Ken Stortz, it's like S-T-O-E or E-O-R-T-S, Stortz <laughs> is the guy. He's one of those unsung people. You don't see his name out like Kevin Kane or people like that. They get the name. Well, they do great things, but he's just one of those guys under the radar that's busily building an empire here in a great old building. Uh, and then if you look right here, you go up to... Hey, yeah, go on in. Hey, open, open up, open up. Get yeah, in there, open up. Guy. Come on, come on. Did he tell me the real facts? Well, we'll find out. You can tell us. Come on. Fact come on, fact check us. What do we know? You guys want to come in? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Be nice, this guy, whoever he is. I said nice things about Ken. That's facts. Oh, that's good. It? I'm Jimmy Ogle. Jimmy, I'm Scott. Willie is, is filming this for Downtown Memphis Commission. Oh, we're filming okay. all my walking tours for their archives. So oh, okay. we're doing Madison Avenue today. So imagine trees being in here. Imagine how hard it is the air conditioning thing. So this is really two buildings here. You got a, a square or rectangular building there with this kind of built out, trapezoidal, whatever you want to call it. So it's actually two in one, so to speak. What do you know? Come here. So this building was actually designed in 1973, if you can believe it. It was very innovative. It was originally a bank. It actually won Building of the Decade Award in the 70s in the Mid-South area. So it's pretty pretty well known and basically we moved in in the summer of 2011 um, after a big capital campaign we were able to get this so uh, this college started out um, this is our 20th year so we started in 2000 in a little warehouse building with 20 students in Lakeland and in Lakeland if you know where that is out off of Canada Road that's where we exit were. 20 I 40 yeah exit 20 <laughs> off I 40 and now we have uh, four campuses and, well, five campuses, probably maybe uh, two, 200 students now. So very niche college, though, uh, training in music, ministry, uh, leadership, things like that. So There are concerts in here periodically? On yeah, we have concerts. Um, you see the... Auditorium in there. Performances, probably our students perform uh, about seven times a semester. We have chapel in there as well for worship services. And then in the summer we have camps and other performances as well. How old are they? Well, they're your typical college age. College age. 18 to 40. <laughs> no. Eight, your average student is probably 18 to 22, a few and a few a little bit older and non traditional students, but yeah, typically college. So we do certificates, bachelor's, and master's degrees. And I did a podcast from here one time for Ken, and I said it went to, it went to Chicago and Dallas. So you got campuses, and she said four now? Chicago, Dallas, 
and then two over on the west coast in California. I'm standing real close to you because this is the microphone right oh, here. He's okay. picking you up, listening okay. to you talk, Willie right. Bearden. What's your name again? My name is Scott Linky. Scott Linky, and your role here is? I'm Director of Academic Affairs. So, so he ought to know. Huh? <laughs> We're very fortunate. I've been and around since the first day, so I know I look young, but I'm actually 64. So. <laughs> Uh, good life. I've lived a good life. Everything else he said today was true besides that. <laughs> and I was telling the story when I was at Rock and Soul, y'all came down to there the first year. I thought it was a bunch of blind kids coming down there yeah. Invisible School. I hadn't oh, yeah. heard of you yet. Well, y'all when, we were, when we were... Why the name? Yeah. So the name, uh, we have nothing to do with optometry and music. Uh, <laughs> or vision impaired markers. Yeah. Visible comes from... Um, there was a... So everybody knows in the city of Memphis, a guy by the name of Martin Luther King Jr., quite significant, unfortunately was shot about a mile away from here. There was a guy 20 years before him in the country of Germany, and he was kind of standing against a not so cool guy named Adolf Hitler, and his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, I don't know if that name, but anyway, he was a pastor in Germany that even though Hitler was kind of claiming uh, the Christian faith, he was kind of like saying, no, that's not really what Jesus stands for. Um, and so he wrote a book. He ended up being martyred and killed, but he wrote a book uh, called The Cost of Discipleship. And he talks about this idea of the visible community that the church needs to be out there in the world as kind of salt and light and not just in its four walls on Sunday and whatnot. And so that word visible comes from uh, that idea that he talks about in his book. So it's kind of our patron saint of the college, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Wow. So. Are all, and, all genres of music covered? Yeah, normally. Now, we would pitch ourselves as a modern music college, a little bit different from a more traditional conservatory model um, of classical training and so forth. Um, so we are multiple genres within more of a modern music. Uh, so you get jazz, rock, gospel, um, R&B, uh, singer-songwriter with an acoustic guitar, uh, you know, quite, you know. Wasn't Ken in a rock and roll band? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so he, a, he, a band probably 25 years ago started in this city. Uh, you may not know them, but they're called Skillet. Um, they were, that's what it was. Yeah, they, they were signed with Ardent Records just down at 2000 Madison Avenue. And uh, now they're a multi-platinum uh, selling record band, played before thousands and thousands. But Ken was in that band the first uh, four or five years. They played at FedEx Forum and in the last few years. Yeah, and they're actually playing this week at Minglewood Hall, just down cool. the road. They played at FedEx Forum with a larger tour. Yeah. Um, and so Ken was the original guitarist in that band, and, and kind of the idea for this college happened as he traveled around the U.S. playing the concerts with young people and just kind of envisioning a place to train young people in music as well as in their faith and ministry background. So, You've heard of W.C. Handy and jazz and rock and roll and Elvis and Sam and Stax and all the great Memphis musical mm. heritage and Royal Studios and... Uptown Funk and mm. Boo Mitchell and all this stuff, but in Germantown School of Rock, and there's a, my nephew's in Germantown School of Rock, you don't know about, think, you have much of y'all heard about Visible, you've heard more about Visible Music School in the last five minutes than all of your life, yeah. from, and, and from a guy who's been with the start, and not realizing this has been going on for 20 years yeah. around here, and look at the facility they have now that was going to be torn down. Mm. The you know, and chamber of all people. Yeah, so the craziest thing was, the uh, person on our board's father was the one who designed this building. Um, his name is Francis Gassner. His yeah. daughter, uh, Gretchen Gassner Turley, was on our board. And when she found out, uh, she's just reading the commercial appeals. Can't tear down my daddy's building. You know? down. Mm. Um, we connected with her, and then she became on our board, and she kind of helped us with our fundraising campaign, capital campaign to secure this building. And again, in 2011 is when we moved in. Yeah, they didn't think small Lakeland. Like I said, Ken wanted that building for the dormitories. <laughs> so he built been a building around over here yeah. enough and some on down the street. Yeah, we here. just built our dorms on the back side. Um, as you walk down yeah, that we'll way, see. you'll see. And we're, it's our move-in day today for students. So that was completed two summers ago. So it's fairly new it houses 
uh, 100 students, I believe is what it is, with uh, studio apartments, so two a room with small kitchenettes and that kind of thing. So that was really important for us. Previously, we had been renting from the Fielder Square apartments just behind that scoreboard there, um, but it was important for us to get our own housing for our students. So. How about that, folks? Yeah. This is our bonus for the day. Isn't it? Always lucky to have somebody like you walk into our tours, and Willie, Willie will send you a copy of this performance oh, okay. here yeah. sooner or later when we get First Tennessee Bank. This was in like the 1950s, the first uh, standalone, standalone uh, drive-through window in Memphis, okay? You know, all the banks are downtown. In the 1949, we move out to Poplar Plaza. They get a, their second bank bank, there's Poplar Plaza right at Prescott. And uh, so somebody had to figure, who, who had the first drive-through window in Memphis? Now we got ATMs, okay, online banking, all this stuff, you know. Out there at Mattis at a union in Cleveland, where the first Tennessee bank is, they built that one there in the 50s, and they were so unsure this would work, they built it to the dimensions that if it didn't work, it could become a piggly wiggly grocery store. That was, they already had a plan B going. They were so doubtful of that. So this is where your first drive through window was and the bank was in Memphis. Now it's Avis, and uh, he does a terrific job there. Cedric, if you want a car, he can get you a car. Now turn around and look over here at the mural, Ray of Hope. Zimmerman's the guy's name that did this. This is about 10 years old. Here's from Chicago. Uh, this vast mural on the tooth building there. Uh, again, there is uh, uh, Robert's on the phone, but I think there is a, uh, a link on the downtown Memphis Commission website that, that takes you to all the murals in downtown Memphis. When you start, there's probably a hundred murals now in downtown. Not this big. It, Artery's going to have 12, but you think over in Barbaro Alley and down on South Main, there are a lot of murals. Is there a link on your website for murals in downtown Memphis? There is. There is. So, uh, Look that up and then go out and start taking pictures. I've tried to do a PowerPoint of all them, just murals of Memphis because there's some outside on other bank buildings and stuff like that. And then if you look at the trolley stop here, Cindy, who used to work at the Mid-South Fair, was the artist for this. See the mosaic tiles on the columns there? Oh, Yeah. And I think there's a credit for them. Somewhere. I'm not, and, on the, and see in the, in the surface over there, there's a mural as well. I'm not getting near that guy. AutoZone Park opened in 2000. It was the finest minor league ballpark in the country when it opened, designed after Turner Field in Atlanta, which is already out of commission. They got the new SunTrust Stadium there. And Camden Yards in Baltimore with the AAA affiliate of the St. Louis Cardinals. This has been Cardinal country for about 80 years. Tim McCarver will be back here second week of October getting installed into the Memphis Sports Hall of Fame, which is going to be in there. Earl Farrell's going to give him his tie from Sleep Out Louis that I gave him on the radio the other day. Uh, anybody go to Sleep Out Louis and remember the fish tank races on Friday afternoons with the goldfish and they had the water guns and they had the that's been saved. Joey and David saved that. We're going to auction that off on the radio as part of Downtown Heritage. But AutoZone Park now is again, uh, what happened, we had the, uh, we've had baseball here since the 1880s. John Ganazza has a whole book on that. Uh, back in 1998, the owner was a double-A baseball team, moved to Jackson, uh, David Hirsch, and that's when Dean Jernigan came back and got involved. And uh, we traded franchises. An expansion franchise went to Louisville, and we got the Cardinals Triple A franchise that came from Louisville to come to Memphis. They played at Tim McCarver Stadium for two years while this was being built and opened in 2000. There's concerts in there. Uh, the big road races like St. Jude Marathon, those start and they finish their races. There's a lot of other alternative uses. They've shown movies before. And now we have a 901 FC soccer team in there, you know? Uh, the same time, you got baseball games for a week, you take the, the mound out of there and play soccer, then you bring the, you bring the, the uh, mound back in. You just don't even worry about it, you know, and they've been doing this in summer. And apparently 901 FC soccer is very popular in Memphis. It's a great new addition. So thank the Peter Strong, I can't pronounce his last name, Strong, and uh, Craig, the general manager, for their innovation of re making that, and again, the Sports Hall of Fame going in there just too, making that a community place for our whole community. Liz. Yeah, so I was flipping through one of the many binders that Jimmy Ogle has passed over to me, <laughs> and in one of them is a newspaper clipping or a magazine clipping talking about the vision of hope. Um, all, of the, all of the people depicted in that mural are locals, um, unknown locals. Um, you know, the Nelson Mandela um, is local. just not, that's not a local, and that's not, Nelson Mandela is not local, and that's not Nelson. Okay. Um, fortunately, that's a sweet older lady with a good sense of humor <laughs> uh, for being mistaken for Nelson Mandela. Um, but part of the per intention of that mural was to depict Memphis, the good and the bad of Memphis all in one. 
Um, you know, I believe there was a skull and crossbones somewhere hidden on that mural that kind of ticked some people off when it was first put up there. But as the artist intended, it's the good and the bad. It's how you want to interpret Memphis. It is the vision of Memphis. So I would interpret, and probably he, he, as he put those various faces, black, white, young, old, male, female, uh, the baseball, the hands, one looks like a rocket. A guy standing in the middle of the look almost like he's a rocket. Look like he's almost a shell too, or a slice of mm -hmm. slice of pie in there. You know, he started looking around. Uh, I would say he probably has a reason. That one big guy you look at, you got my attention now. That one big guy, uh, he probably has a reason. He's got something to look inside, or you know, I'm sure, in the artist's own mind, kind of like in my own mind. Sometimes I don't know what I'm saying, but uh, there's got to be a, a good explanation for every single one of those images on there. And we can get that off his whoever the artist's website is, whatever. Right behind us is the YMCA building, opened 1909, and we we're still primitive in our streets here at that time. So we paved Madison Avenue down all the way down here for President Taft's visit to open <laughs> the YMCA to dedicate it, make us look like a big city. Y'all okay? Come on, make it look like a big city, you know. And uh, uh, and there's pictures of President Taft in a convertible, you know, one of those old timey convertibles, you know, square cars here topping the hat right there in front of this part right here Fogelman YMCA what it's called now the Fogelman names obviously a big uh, real estate developer in Memphis and the whole family of different strains of family from Lewis this is Lewis Fogelman I believe uh, and they were glad to be a part of the Audubon, uh, AutoZone Park renewal right here uh, on down Madison you got the Fielder Square Apartments he was talking about residential came in with AutoZone Park to 4th Street there we had to realign 4th Street 4th Street used to come about right in here to get the ballpark built in, we had to move 4th Street down Union a while, and it lined up right there, because 4th Street used to zigzag back and forth from Bill to Poplar. It never was straight like third or second, or front. So it wasn't any trouble moving 4th Street on down to accommodate the ballpark and that part. And let's come to the, the building right here, the Common, it's called the Commonwealth Building now. Let's see if we can stand by the front door long enough so somebody will let us in. Yeah, now this, and it's air conditioned, unlike the visible. <laughs> but okay, built I think 1926 is the Medical Arts Building. Okay, seven different dental labs in here. That's why you see those numbers again. Think about 26. Come on through. Come on through. Don't worry about us. Just come on through. Y'all live here? Oh, okay. Enjoy it. Good. Um, and all those addresses, because you didn't have again anything past the medical center hardly. You know, you did have the. You know, Baptist, uh, UT opened 1911, Baptist 1912, Methodist 1918, Lebanon 1923. Small buildings, you know, that's grown, 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 and grown. So, again, you're coming from downtown to here rather than from there expanding out to the east. And now they've regionalized. So that's why you had, this was the Medical Arts Building that became the Hickman Building. It was an office building. It closed in 1971. I think there were some military things here in World War II. And so... It's been empty since 1971 until this last year. Like Willie just said, I never thought that ever get, because Willie drove by it every day coming to work, you know. And, uh, yeah, 1926. You sold your warehouse too quick. You better believe that. All right, so here's the story. Now, a guy by the name of David Carlson called me about a year and a half ago. He says, I hear you know a lot about Memphis. You give tours. You've been on my website. He wanted to know some quirky history things about Memphis. So I met with him up there at Hotel Napoleon. We kind of went through the newspapers. And I said, let's walk around for a second because here's November the 6th, 1934 Street, or Thomas Edison lived here. And I took him over, and he changed the bulletin board, you know, and, and I came back a second time with somebody else. So I sent him my 10-page thing of all the little fast, fun facts and everything because he wanted to draw this mural to be in here. He's done this, and the guy's name is Landis. I don't know if the artist's name is on here. If y'all find it for me, Landis something. Uh, and, they, and they've done this before, like in Chicago, and he wanted to get the, the feel for the neighborhood and unusual things about the neighborhood. And I think, I think and look at all the, the records, sun stacks, sun stacks, sun stacks, all the way around, there's a border. And so I started looking at it the other day. I came in here after we did our courthouse tour. The girls invited me over. Girls. And, uh, and I, and I started looking, and I went, oh, my goodness, look right here. My name is Jimmy, and we're going to start our tour of, the Memf of Memphis here from the River Gauge. Because I'd taken him there. And, so, and then you go, the river level fluctuates 40 feet during the course of the year. How many times have you heard me say that? So I'm quoted right here, Willie. Really. Isn't that cool? That's then I started looking, and every gallon of water, there's a teaspoon of mud. How many times have you heard me say that? So I got, he was recording me, and all these things pop in here. 
Uh, there's about 10 of me in there, I guess. Uh, but he picked up other history as well uh, about Tom Lee. And, and so it's just laced with all different little history things in there. There are the streets. Isn't that beautiful artwork? That kind of artwork. Uh, this is one of them, and it's backlit. And this one, this light has never been on behind us here. I don't know why, but it's a bar scene, you see. I'm not exactly sure what that depicts. But when you come up here, you could probably spend a half an hour reading all these little things in here. Kimmons Wilson created a hotel industry standards when he built the first Holiday Inn. Well, he has that at this site here where they had a Holiday Inn in the 1950s, not the one out on summer, but he just wanted to get Kimmons Wilson's name in here. Press Box Loft, B.B. King recorded four, four, his first four songs while working here at WDIA, you know, because it had moved from Midtown down to downtown by that time. Thomas Boggs created us the largest, the toppest Briggs, which was Welcome Wagon. That was over there at Second and Court where the appeal bidding was. You know, they had a big flag was on there, but then they had the big globe, if you remember, for a welcome wagon. That started in Memphis. So all through here, and then a few other general scenes, Memphis musical notes. Uh, Marshall Avenue. I'm going to try to figure out between now and 2 o'clock the, the naming of the origin of Marshall Avenue. I'll, I'll probably get it by then, but uh, he's already done it. Uh, well, we're at the Commonwealth Building right here. It's in large down, I guess, Madison. So here's Union Avenue. Here's Monroe. Uh, so it's kind of overhanging Monroe. Monroe's, Monroe's actually blocked off at AutoZone Park right here, you see. So here's Madison. So this is kind of comes. So the YMCA, you don't see the YMCA building. It's kind of enlarged it across the street, so to speak, because we should be right in front of Madison. There's Madison right there. So and see, here's, uh, here's a, it kind of covers up the Steric Building, too. <laughs> But, you know, and this helps me with some of uh, Bates Alley. I'm not, I don't think I've ever seen that. They probably started with a basic Memphis map of some kind. For the art. I don't know how artists could ever draw something like this, but he had to trace or throw the image up on a wall, I guess, and, and draw too, you know. I've seen people do that. Uh, Zebulon Pike, Mary Lewis, Zachary Taylor. David Crockett, Sam Houston, yeah, that's, that's all in my thing. 6,000 gallons of water a second. Actually, it's a minute, eight miles per hour past Memphis. 31 states, two provinces in Canada. <laughs> One's barge is 35 by 95. <laughs> there they all in post all right there. Uh, that's FedEx Forum. It just doesn't say FedEx Forum on the roof, but that's, yeah, it looks like it's... It's that eye looking at you from the mural over there. It's, it's, you call it a spider web, you see. Uh, Recorded so this is a very nice air-conditioned way to end our tour today. <laughs> uh, and uh, the Mississippi flood of 1927, that's a, yeah. That's just a neat piece right there. And... Uh, again, this building is now uh, office spaces and residential, half and half, I think. And on this first floor, there is like a little coffee shop around here open during the week right now. It's just open this year, just in the last few months. Yeah, it's just brand new spanking open, you know. So it ain't quite filled up yet. Really? Is that one of the brothels? The mall. Oh, is that where they do the mall? Come around, the, come around here. <laughs> Actually, where it says Bill Street Entertainment System. Oh, there it is. Castle just in there, yeah. Well, okay. Well, that's the Monarch. That was an old hotel or building there because uh, we had all sorts of houses of commercial affection during that time, mm -hmm. brothels, and, and even some of those women were heroes of the yellow fever, saving, you know, they, 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 they made their employees leave so they could treat <laughs> victims, employees being the ladies, and they died treating Front, uh, women like that, uh, and um, God, Happy Hooker's the name of the uh, stone. Right there on November the Sixth Street in Gayoso. Yeah, so. Happy Hooker, I forget her name right now, but there's actually a recognizing her efforts right there. Uh, she's on our Women of Achievement. No, she's on the <laughs> list of names, not Women of Achievement, but the list of a name of a woman. They're on Hattie Manley there at Court Square. She got arrested for being on a, a streetcar in the 1880s. A black woman sitting at the front of the streetcar. It's on the second court, second street side, right there, near uh, right across from uh, Apothecary in that quadrant. 
That's 70 years before Rosa Parks got arrested for doing that, you know. Somebody's doing that in Memphis. Let's take, I want somebody to take a picture of me here in front of this thing. Because every time I'm in here, I'm by myself. Let's have a big round of applause for you. Oh. <laughs> yeah.